Hello, everyone. Excited to be here. Good evening to you, or for me, good morning. Um, excited to talk about pandas. I have written a couple books on pandas. I wrote the Pandas uh, 1x cookbook. Um, I've done some machine learning books and, and some uh, other Python books. So I run a company called Metasnake that is corporate training consulting. And hopefully I have seen some of you in some classes before, but I'm excited to talk about pandas. So if, if you're interested in uh, these concepts, follow me up. I am doing some more hands-on courses on these. So what we're going to talk about is loading our data, um, looking at the types of data, doing chaining operations, mutating data. Uh, using the apply method and aggregation. So this is not a beginner's talk with pandas. I'm gonna assume that you have some knowledge of pandas and uh, this is gonna be some best practices, some things I've seen from uh, using pandas for a long time, teaching pandas to thousands and writing books on pandas and seeing a lot of bad uh, recommendations out there, sort of my rant to, to help people. So I'm just gonna load my libraries here. Um, let me just clear my cells here. Okay, so um, I'm loading pandas. I'm using pandas 1.3, but you don't have to use that. Most of the things that I'm gonna talk about here are applicable to uh, basically any version of pandas that's released in the past four years or so. I'm using a data set from uh, uh, fueleconomy.gov. It's a US website that basically every car that's sold in the US attracts uh, some metrics about that. So uh, like miles per gallon, uh, uh, information about this, the engine, that sort of thing. And, and this has, uh, I, if I scroll down here, you can see that there's 41,000 rows and 83 columns. So pretty big data set here. So I'm just going to show some steps that I do and some processes. I'm gonna pull out a certain number of these columns. Uh, city mileage, the combined highway and city mileage, the highway mileage, the number of cylinders, the number of the displacement in the car, the type of drive, an engine description, a fuel cost, a make, model, transmission type, the range, when it was created, and the year. So a bunch of different types here and show uh, some practices that I like to do. So one thing you might want to do is look at those D types, and you can see that we've got integers, floats, and objects. Generally, these objects here are going to be string types. Um, but they could be numeric types or date types as well. Let's look at how much memory we're using here. I'm gonna use beep equals true to make sure that because I have string types, I'm capturing the amount of string types here. And let's just sum that up. And so we've got like 19 megs of data. Now I'm just gonna go through cleaning these up a little bit. I said we're gonna look at the types. So let's look at the integer columns. I'm gonna select the integer columns and then do a describe method on them to look at the range here. You can see that, for example, the combined goes up to 136, highway goes up to 124. We've got some that are going up to like 7,000 or so but uh, different ranges there. I actually wouldn't write this like this. I recommend using this chaining style. So what I do is I put a parenthesis at the front that tells Python that this is a parenthetical, like doing math, uh, add addition before multiplication with math. But it also allows me to escape Python uh, indentation rules. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put all of these operations on a single line. So this is the same as uh, the code above here, just written on multiple lines because it allows me to very easily see what's going on. Uh, let me just show you here. I can sort of walk through this. Here's my original data frame. I'm gonna pull out these columns. Oops. And I'm going to uh, select a few columns that are integers and I'm gonna describe those columns. Uh, so for example, maybe I wanna change some of these column types. By default, pandas uses int64. Uh, if I use the NumPy library, I can see that the a int eight, which is an eight bit integer or one byte integer goes up to 127. So I could probably use that for highway 08. If we look at the int 16, we can see that that goes up to 32,000. And so for most of these, I can update them. So I've just got uh, an operation here I'm gonna say, I want to use the as type method to convert highway to int eight, city to int 16, combined to int 16. And let's just do a describe on these new columns here. And, and that looks good. You can look at the maximum value here and the minimum value if you want to as well and see that uh, I can certainly use those types without any loss of information. <clears throat> okay, and if I wanna look at all the integer types, I can do select D types with integer as a string, and I can look at all the integer types in there, and those look good after I've applied this update here. Um, 
Let's look at the memory usage now after doing this, and now I'm down to 18 megs. So it saved a little bit here by just changing a few of those types. Same thing for floats here. I can look at the float types. And so I've got cylinders, that's the number of cylinders, and engine displacement here. Um, it looks like cylinders is integer-esque. Let's just do a describe on that. And you can see that uh, the quantiles are the minimum, maximum, 25th, 20, 25th, uh, 50th, and 75th percentile. Those are all integers. So this is actually an integer column, but because it had missing values in it, uh, you can see that uh, there are 206 missing values using that value counts there. Uh, that uh, it, Pandas doesn't support missing values on uh, lowercase in 64 types. So I'm gonna query that and just look at where those values are missing. And if you look at where the values are missing, uh, we see like, uh, Ultra EV, RAV4 EV, RAV4 EV. Um, so a lot of these are electric vehicles. And so maybe we only want to say, you know, if I've got, uh, if it's missing rather than saying it's missing, uh, say it's zero and then convert that to an integer eight. Uh, similar with displacement, I've got some missing values in there. I'm just gonna fill those in with zero as well. And uh, we can summarize that and just make sure that that looks okay after doing that. Um, and, and so um, let's convert uh, our float, our displacement to float 16 instead of float. You can, again, use that NumPy F info, float info to look at the ranges of your floating point. And if we do that, um, it looks like our data looks okay there. We can sum up our memory usage now and we're now down to 17 megs uh, by converting those to int eight and floats. Let's look at object types. And uh, for object types, again, generally those are strings, but um, these are the comps I've got here. Drive, engine description, make, model, transmission, and create it on. So it looks like drive is probably categorical. Engine description looks like somewhat free form. Uh, make is categorical, models categorical, somewhat with, with a large degree of cardinality. Uh, transmission actually looks like two columns and created on looks like a date. So let's try and, and just look at those. The first thing I like to do is I like to apply this value counts method to uh, my categorical columns. And there you go. You can see that drive indeed is categorical. Let's look at where drive is missing. I said drop in A is false here and you can see that there's 1100 values that are missing there. I just use this query here to look where they're are missing. And it looks like a lot of these again are electric vehicles here. Just scrolling through them, it looks like a lot of electric vehicles. So maybe what I do is I say, uh, I wanna fill in the missing drive values with other. And then after I do that, convert that to a category. Also, I'm gonna convert the make to a category as well. And let's look at our memory usage. Our memory usage is now down to 12 megs. So we've gone, we started at 19, we're down to 12. Um, we still got a bit to go. Uh, let's look at transmission. Transmission looks like a column that has two pieces of information, whether something's manual or automatic, and also the number of speeds. So I'm gonna split this apart into two columns here. And so what I'll do is I'll make an automatic column, which is just whether it contains auto, the string auto and speeds. I'll use a regular expression to extract the number there. If there are missing values, I'll fill it in with 20 and convert that to an int eight. And let's look at our memory usage. Now we're down to 10 megs here. So that's almost half as much as we were using originally. Uh, let's convert our dates. We do have that created on. So I'm gonna uh, try and do um, two date time. Now I get an error here. Or uh, not really an error, but a warning here that um, it says that uh, the, the time zone EST is, is identified but not understood. Turns out that EST isn't a time zone. It's an abbreviation, um, but it's not a time zone. It's a... It, and so uh, there, there's this thing that says past TZ info's argument to correctly uh, make it time zone aware. Turns out that Pandas really doesn't expose that at, at this level here. So I've, I've got a little bit more to do on that. So here, here's just the issue here. It's got these ESTs and EDPs in here and uh, Pandas, um, it will convert it, but it's gonna give that warning there. So I, I have to jump through a, through a few hoops to get this to go. Um, I'm gonna replace the EDT with the offset. Then I'm gonna convert that to UTC. And then given that this is all in uh, Eastern time zone. So I'm gonna, uh, or the New York time zone. So this is actually America, New York is a proper uh, IANA time zone. And let's run that. And you can see that when I run that, um, 
I don't get any warnings here. I'm also pulling off the engine description and uh, we'll look at engine description as well. Turns out that handling time zones and dates is kind of a pain. Probably in my next uh, series of talks that I'm going to do is probably on time zone handling in pandas since it's not super straightforward. But um, uh, let's look at handling this FFS or this uh, engine description. You can see that this is more just free form. It's got like parentheses and non parentheses and weird spacing in here. So this looks like free form data, which is the vein of like a data scientist or someone who's analyzing data. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say, let's just pull out whether there's FFS in there. So as a Boolean, and then I'm just going to drop that. And I mean, if you look here, there's a lot that have FFS in them. And so maybe that's some sort of indicator here. So at the end, I'm going to have this function here called tweak. And uh, let's just run it and make sure that it works. And it looks like it does. This is just going to clean up our columns. And uh, that looks pretty good. Now, that's the first part, getting types right. Once you've got types right, that enables you to save memory, but also if you have string types, you can do string manipulation. If you have categorical types, you can do string and categorical manipulation. If you have dates, you can do date manipulation. So it's really nice to get your types in the right format. Now, the, part two is uh, chaining, and so, uh, if I find a lot of people aren't used to this style. It's also called flow programming. And rather than making intermediate variables, we just leverage the fact that in pandas, most every operation will return a new object. And we'll just work on that and we'll just keep doing that. And um, so I've got a hint here. If you can't find a way to chain, you can use the pipe method to do, to do chains. So pipe method is a method in pandas that takes a function that takes the current value of the data frame or the series, and then you can return whatever you want from that. Generally, I'll return a data frame from that. Um, but this is my little function, and I like to do this when I'm using pandas. I'll, I'll take a raw data set, and I'll go through a process similar to what I just showed, and then I'll make a function called tweak, whatever my data is, and I'll put that right at the top of my data frame. So I start with my raw data, and then I have another function that will clean it up. When I come back to my notebook, I just run the cell to load my raw data, I run the cell to clean it up, and I'm good to go. So uh, the other thing, if you look at this, it reads like a recipe, right? I'm going to take my autos data frame. I'm going to plot these columns. I'm going to assign these columns here. I'm going to assign cylinders, displacement, et cetera. I'm going to convert these types, and I'm going to drop these two columns as well. So this looks just like a recipe, step by step, what you're going to do with it. It makes it your code easy to read. Now, compare and contrast that code up here. These easy steps of what I'm going to do, step by step, with something like this. This is what I normally see in like medium posts or whatever. And this is only going. I mean, this isn't doing everything here, but this is sort of what people will do. They'll make these intermediate variables and then do some operations. It's you know, does it work? It might work. And if I run it here, you'll see that there are a bunch of warnings. And this is sort of the bane of uh, people who use pandas everywhere, like this setting with copy warning. Like no one knows what this really is. They'll uh, throw in a bunch of copies into their data to get around it. Well, the whole reason people are trying to use this style is to not make copies, but they end up making copies anyway. So. I don't recommend this style here. Uh, note that it's longer and it's not as clear as this. It's not as readable. Your colleagues actually won't like it as much either. You won't like it as much when you come back to it. So I highly encourage you not to use that. Now, some people claim that it's not easy to debug or understand this code, but with this, you can debug it really easy. I don't buy that. Um, again, after using pandas for many years, um, it's not the case. If, if you want to, you can, like I said before, you can just sort of comment these out and you can walk through each step and see what's going on with each step as you run it. Alternatively, you can do things like I'm showing here, leverage this pipe. So if I want to see um, what the intermediate variable is after this first step in my recipe, I can pipe in this function that I made right up here, get var, which is just going to make a variable called D3. So let's run this. And if I look down here, this D3 is the intermediate variable. So I can do things like that if I want an inter intermediate variable. Uh, alternatively, I can also pipe in like this, a function that just calls display. And this is, again, the IPython display function that will show something in the notebook. And if you run this, you actually see that um, this prints out uh, the intermediate state right there. 
And then the output is actually right here below that. So you can uh, tack in these pipe operations here to either make a variable or show the content if you want to. And that will make it really easy to debug and see what's going on. Also, again, I do recommend that commenting out and stepping through your code that way. And the next step here is, uh, or the next part of the talk is don't mutate. And again, when I show this to people, people are like, well, Matt, you're wasting all this memory. Um, you're not using the in place. You're not using the assign or you're not using index assignments. So you're, you're wasting memory. And it turns out that uh, maybe I am, but that's how Pandas works. And it, uh, Jeff Reback, core developer of Pandas says, um, uh, in place, the in place operation rarely does something in place. You're thinking you're saving memory, but you're not in place usually basically makes a copy under the covers and then returns or sticks the copy in for the other object there. So you're not really saving any more memory than you would with using chaining. There's actually a bug that I've linked to to remove and deprecate in place. Um, so in summary, if you do mutate, and, and I, again, I see a lot of people saying you need to mutate or whatever. Um, you don't really get performance benefits from it. You can't chain if you do that. So you're gonna, your code's gonna be ugly. And then you're gonna get all these silly setting with copy warnings that you're gonna go around and you're gonna make copies to get rid, rid of those. And you're, you're, you're actually like making it worse for yourself by doing that. So it, you'll note that if you use the style that I show with a sign and not using copy, you'll never run into a copy issue at all. Okay, and the next part here is don't apply if you can. So here, here's my autos data set. I'm just gonna make this autos two here. Now this is very US centric. We talk about things like miles per gallon. Well, most people around the world use things like uh, liters per 100 kilometers here. So if I wanted to convert that um, city mileage to liters per 100 kilometers, I could do something like this with a Python function that does that conversion for me using the apply method. Um, However, I could also use a vectorized broadcast operation just saying 235 divided by the series. And if you look at these, they give you the same result here. Um, now, um, the difference here being that the apply is going through, pan, through Python and the other one is not. And so if you actually look at the timing here, uh, when I ran these on my machine earlier this morning, uh, we got uh, around uh, 52 times uh, slower for using apply. That's because it has to deserialize, stick things into pandas and go back. And so it, right now it, um, it looks like it's even slower. So, uh, but around 50, in this case, around 50, uh, percent uh, performance increase for a numeric operation. So uh, a ploy, sorry, uh, avoid, uh, apply if you're doing math. Now, I'm gonna do some string manipulation here. Maybe you wanna say like, is something an American car, right? So here's car makes that are American. And let's uh, use apply on that versus this is in, which is a method on uh, a series here. And when you run this, you're gonna see that the difference here isn't uh, quite as drastic here. And the reasoning here is that string operations in pandas aren't vectorized. And so um, I, I say avoid apply. I think uh, you can make the exception that if you're doing string manipulation, apply might be better. Um, now note that make here is actually categorical. And, and so um, you do get some benefits from doing the categorical operation because it doesn't have to do it on every single string. I'm just going to make an auto three here where I convert uh, uh, make back to a string and you'll see that when I um, do these operations on the strings, uh, there is a performance penalty on them. So, uh, and in this case, you can see that apply goes from being uh, almost as fast as that to a lot slower uh, when we convert it back to a string here. Um, Okay, and, and so these other examples are just showing uh, some other ways to do this. You can use um, a where operation or, or you can use np select or np.where, which uh, are basically the pandas and numpy versions of, of doing like if statements. And again, I would recommend doing those if 
you've got numeric operations. If you're doing string manipulations, then you might uh, be fine with apply again because apply isn't vectorized, or sorry, string operations aren't vectorized in pandas. Okay, the next part here is master aggregations. So uh, if you're not familiar with aggregations, they're sort of like pivot tables in, um, in Excel. Uh, so I'm gonna take my autos data frame here and I'm gonna group it by year. You'll see that this returns a lazy object. And then I'm gonna take the mean of that. And so what that does is it puts the year into the index and gives me the mean of every numeric column there. This is kind of cool. I mean, literally this could be written as one line of code. I've written it as three because it's easier to understand. But with one line of code here, I have pretty uh, big powers here. Now this can be confusing. Uh, let's do another one here. I'm gonna uh, group it by year, then I'm gonna pull out the combined mileage and the speed mileage and then take the mean of that. Uh, uh, we can also do this, we can say group it by year. Um, and instead of, uh, uh, I can take the mean first and then pull off combined and speeds after that. Now, if you change the order of that, you're gonna get uh, the same behavior, but um, your timing might be different because you can see if we pull off combined end speeds after we do the aggregation, we have to ag we're aggregating all the numeric columns up here. We're just aggregating those two columns. So that order there can make a difference depending on how many columns you want. Um, I'm going to just set some styling here because I'm going to add some plots in here. Um, so what I'd like to do is now I can like visualize this as well pretty quickly here. So again, here's here's my group by, it's lazy, let's take the mean, and I'm gonna use pandas to plot this. It turns out when you do a plot in pandas by default as a line plot, it's gonna plot the in um, each column against the index. So the index will be the x-axis, each column will be its own line here. So it's pretty easy to make a little line. You can see that, um, my styling has a font that is, is missing on this machine, but I'll just sort of ignore that pink warning here. But there, there's a visualization, makes it very easy to see that combined mileage is going up in recent years, speed's going up slightly as well, but not as much as combined mileage. Now, once I've got this little chain here, you know, I, I can look at instead of the mean, if I wanna look at the median, I just sort of swap these uh, methods out. There's the median. I can look at the 30th percent quantile, right? or the standard deviation or the variance. So uh, by using uh, this chain style, it makes it very easy to just try things out and see what's going on, right? And if I want the original data, I just comment out that plot and I'm back to my data right there. Now let's, in this case, I'm gonna uh, group by two objects. I'm gonna group by year and country and take the mean of that. And um, uh, it says country is not defined. so. Let me let me find my deaf country. So I forgot to forgot to run that deaf country there. Okay, so deaf country is just a function that says, you know, is it in the U.S. or is it in another country here? So let's go back down to uh, where we were. Okay, so what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a new column called country, then I'm gonna group by year and country and then take the mean value. Now you see that this is what's called a hierarchical or multi-index. The index has two values in it. If you've used pivot tables, that should be somewhat familiar to you. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do my aggregation by those two columns, but I'm gonna aggregate uh, with multiple aggregation functions. Take the minimum value, the mean value, and the second to last. This is a user-defined aggregation, just showing that you can make an aggregation there. And there we go. Now we've got not only multiple uh, multi-index here, but also hierarchical columns as well. And, and so you can go crazy with that if you want to. So one thing you might wanna do is try and plot that. And you get this plot that's a little bit silly because it's trying to plot this X, uh, uh, you know, each of these columns against this X axis, which is now a tuple here with year and country. So it's a little bit weird. Um, but what you can do is you can learn to leverage this thing called unstack. So let me just show you this code here. Here's uh, what I had before. And now I'm gonna unstack this. What this is gonna do is gonna take the innermost uh, index here, the country, and stick it up there in the column. So you can see that now I just have year here. And uh, and if I wanted to now, what I can do after I do that, I can plot this city 08 column. So let me just sort of walk through this. 
So there's my unstack here. I'm going to pull up CD08 column that has two sub columns below that, US and other. And I'm going to plot that. And now I can easily visualize what's going on with the mean city mileage for the US and other countries over the past uh, 20 years or so. And I can use this little matplotlib code to stick the legend out there so it's not on top of my plot there. So again, you could write this as one line of code, but I'm, I'm splitting it out there to make it clearer to see. Um, and if I want to smooth this out, I can just stick in a rolling here. So uh, a lot of people will do that with like time series data. Uh, so take a rolling average. So I just say rolling three, take three segments here and take the mean of that to aggregate that. And that just smooths it out. You can see this one's a little more jagged. This one's a little bit more smooth. Okay. Um, so in summary, uh, correct types will save space. Uh, they will enable math if you have like string types that need to be converted to numbers or they will also enable things like date functionality as well. I'm a huge proponent of chaining. If you don't chain, you should start doing it. It's going to make your code more readable. It's going to remove bugs, and it's going to make it easier to debug. I, I showed all of those things here. Um, also, don't mutate in pandas. Um, there's usually no point. Embrace chaining. I realize that uh, a lot of people don't use chaining, but if you look at like the core developers, they actually recommend that, this style as well. Uh, Again, apply is slow for math operations. So I, I see a lot of people saying, use apply, use apply. Don't use apply unless it's a last resort. Um, apply works fine for string manipulation, but uh, for math, generally, you want to use something else. Otherwise, you're going to have slow operations. And lastly, aggregations are powerful. Uh, I get it if you haven't used them a lot, especially like unstack or hierarchical multi-indexes can be confusing. Uh, so my advice there is just to look at examples and start playing with them until they start to make sense. If you found this interesting and uh, you like these sorts of things, follow me on Twitter, Dunder M. Harrison. I tend to tweet a lot about Python and data science, again, because that's what I do for my work. I teach people how to leverage Python and tell lies with data. And like I said before, I, I'm going to have an upcoming course where uh, we're going to work on these sorts of things on your own data. So if you're interested in that idiomatic pandas workshop, um, again, follow me on Twitter there. OK, uh, let's see. There are some questions here. Aditha says, I think I saw something on the lines of in place not being the best way. I use in place to reduce the code and not to assign it to the same data frame. Is there a better way to do this without in place? Yeah, you should use chaining. So if you use chaining, uh, like you, you saw in my example above, Aditha, you'll have less lines of code compared to the non-chained version. Um, you won't have any bugs, and it's going to be easier for you to read, especially if you make one of those tweak uh, functions. Uh, you're going to be able to come back to your notebook and just uh, use your notebook very easily. OK, other questions? We got like a minute left, I think. Yep. OK. Well, I'm not seeing anything here. If you want to reach out to me, um, I'll be in the speaker lounge for a little bit. Or you can reach out to me on Twitter. Happy to uh, continue the conversation there. Thanks, everyone, for letting me join you. It's been a pleasure. Have a great conference. And um, hope to maybe in the future actually be at PyCon India. Bye, everyone. Have a great day.